looks like we're starting to get to about the numbers of um, panelists um, that we normally have. So um, to avoid going over, I will get us started today. So thank you everybody for joining us for um, the April edition of the neonatal hemodynamics targeted neonatal echocardiography and neonatal neonatologist performed echocardiography founda foundations curriculum. Um, just a quick reminder of kind of the, the things that we um, that we say every each time. Um, those of you that are panelists, um, you guys have been identified as hemodynamics either trainees or um, junior faculty, and so you do have the ability to unmute yourself and uh, turn your video on. I do ask that all of you make sure that you're muted uh, for the the talk and only unmute yourself when you are wanting to ask a question. Um, this session is recorded, and so if there is discussion within the lecture time period, that will be on the recording. However, at the end of the recording, we will stop, um, and the Q&A session that's um, that's scheduled for after the lecture um, will not be recorded. And the lecture will be on our YouTube channel um, soon after this. For those of you that are just the webinar participants, um, please, we do want you to uh, participate as well and to ask your questions. Uh, we do get some great questions from the audience. Uh, however, we will take priority to our trainee questions. So if those don't get answered, that is usually the reason why. But please remember to put your questions into the Q&A box, um, not the chat box. Sometimes the chat box gets um, utilized a lot and we can lose those questions. So the Q&A, which is right next to the chat box, please put those questions in there. Um, we uh, do have a session evaluation with the QR code. I will put this up again at the end of the session for you to grab so that you can fill out the evaluation. We do listen to those and we do make changes based on those suggestions. So please uh, make sure that you uh, do your evaluations. Um, and so without further ado, uh, let me introduce our speaker for this uh, session. Dr. Joseph Ting is an associate professor in the Division of Neonatal Perinatal Care at the University of Alberta and staff neonatologist at Stollery Children, Children's Hospital. He completed his residency in pediatrics, his postgraduate diploma in infectious diseases, and master of public health in medical statistics, all from the University of Hong Kong, and was trained in TNE at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. His research interests include neonatal infections and antimicrobial stewardship and neonatal hemodynamics in TNE. So he is going to be talking to us today um, about the hemodynamics of septic shock. Um, and then a reminder that our next lecture is uh, in May, and that will be on ECMO physiology. And um, we hope to see you then too. But let's get started. Joseph, I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand it on over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Laura. And thanks for the group for the invite. So let me share the screen. Um, uh, can you, uh, can people hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah, let me share the screen. Um, okay, um, can we see the slideshow uh, well? Yes. Yep. Okay, so uh, today my talk is about the neonatal septic shock. Um, I don't have any financial relationship to disclose or conflicts of interest to Decria. I am grateful to my teachers in uh, in pediatric cardiology back in Hong Kong, as well as my teachers um, of the TNE faculty at the the U University of Toronto. Um, I've been in Canada like for almost like ten years. Um, so, I'm good. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to bring up two scenarios that like many of us have encountered them at the NICU. I'll talk about the classification powerful physiology of neonatal uh, septic shock. And we are going to do how are we going to approach, assess, and and um, do the diagnostic evaluation. Uh, last but not the least, of course, is talk about the management based on the pathophysiology. Um, scenario one is like, so there's a female infant born 
at 27 weeks, uh, 920 gram. Mom's received steroids and her membranes rupture at delivery. Initial stabilizations, sorry, is a her her initial stabilization include NIPVV, UV, TPN, antibiotics, and um, initial sepsis screen negative and antibiotics stop at 36 hours. Feeding well, and then lines were removed. On day 28, um, the baby's clinical condition worsened and um and at 3 a.m. It always happens at 3 a.m. The, uh, the baby became lethargic, hypothermic, apnea, increased oxygen requirement, very distant abdomen, heart rate 185, uh, the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure 45, diastolic blood pressure 18. Uh, clinically, it's well perfused. Abdominal x-ray, you see uh, portal venous gas, pneumatosis, intestine, the edis, so you reintubate the baby, sepsis evaluation, antibiotics. So what would you do? Next, so I give you some answers. I I'm not able to do any poll here, but like, I just put up some of the uh potential solutions. Normal saline. Uh, maybe you like to give some bolus a uh, resuscitation. Maybe you like to start some dopamine, epinephrine, no epi, dobutes, mirinone, hydrocortisone, PG, or because after you intubate, you found the FL two was eighty percent. You like to start the nitric oxide right away. Well, I don't know. So what will be your response? Think about that. I'll give you uh, five seconds to think about that. So these are the, yeah, what would you do? So the team put in the normal saline. Uh, the baby is kind of like responding a little bit. Systolic blood pressure go to 50, diastolic 20, heart rate 175, drop from 180 to 175. Uh, FL2 50% is not that bad, like PIP 25, PEP 8. So um, it's very lucky they have someone who do the TN echo on the night shift. They found the fractional shortener of LV was robust 45. Uh, LVO was 330. The ventricles look very underfilled, RVO 300, Doppler over the mitral valve, E ratio 0.7, IVRT 55 minutes seconds, tiny PDA, tiny PFO, probably left to right shunting, wrong interventricular septum on the parasternal short axis view, which basically speaks against any significant pulmonary hypertension. So what would you do next? Are you going to change your mind in terms of what you have done? So, as promised, I give you five seconds to think about that. I cannot see your answers on the chat box, but it's okay. Scenario two. So, is a baby like born in 24 weeks, 600 gram, P prom, GPS status unknown, after birth, like intubate with the two doses of the, oh, so, sorry for the typo. I don't know why, like, uh, intubate with two doses of surfactant, UAU replacement, TPN, antibiotics. Initial sepsis screening negative, antibiotics stop at 36 hours. So in that unit, they like to give the prophylactic indomethacin. So on day three, the baby's clinical condition worsened, FL 100%, motto, poorly perfused, lethargic, hypothermic, very distant abdomen. So people think of like, quote unquote, warm shock in the last scenario, but right now, you have a very mortal, very badly perfused uh, scenario. Heart rate 165, systolic is uh, 35, diastolic blood pressure is 15. X ratios, classical RDS, type of the picture have not completely resolved, not surprised. The lung actually didn't look back at all to explain the FL to 100%. Abnormal X ray shows a couple of segments of the, those power. You uh, worry about the SIP, but there's no evidence of pneumoperitoneum to suggest spontaneous intestinal perforation. Of course, the almost the knee-jerk response from the uh, our neonatal colleagues will repeat the sepsis evaluation, start the antibiotics. So at this point, what are you going to do from the hemodynamic perspective? Which medications or which actions you are going to take? Again, I give you five seconds to think about that. Okay, five seconds is up. So um, somehow someone doing TNE was called urgently back to the hospital. 
and then do the TNE. The LV fraction shortening is 25%. LVO is 50, five zero mils per kilo per minute. Uh, RVO was 60. So uh, very dilated RV, compressing the LV, some tricuspid regurgitations, Doppler EA ratio 0 0.6, IVRT 55, PDA. Oh, PDA, they, they do, there's no ductal flow. Careful, they couldn't see any flow across it. Some paradoxical septal motion and systole. So uh, I I uh, use this uh, uh, kind of like these pictures from one of the reference, but this is not the actual picture, but like of that patient, but you see the dilated RV bulging into the LV is kind of like paradoxical septal motion and systole. So while um, the sonography, uh, not the neonatologist is doing the echo, at the same time, like, uh, oh, he got the uh, information subsequently that like the blood culture was like found to have an E. coli, presumably. So what would you do? So what would you do? Uh, PPH, uh, presumably high pulmonary pressure, poor contractility, poor cardiac output, and you get start the dop dopamine to improve the blood pressure, start some murinone, start some PGE, start the nitric, or I don't know. So again, I'm not able to see your answers. Think about that. These are all the answers I, that are possible. So going back to what we know, and um, so um, neonatal sepsis actually has changed a lot in the past 20, 30 years. If you're interested in reading those neonatal literature, in the old days, people always worry about GBS, GBS, and GBS. So right now, especially for those early onset sepsis, GBS is not the top pathogen. The top pathogen is E. coli in preterm infants, while, while the GBS is still the top pathogens in term infants. And people have been concerned about the, um, the uh, uh, oh, okay. So the people have been concerned about the, um, the, the emergence of the resistance uh, among the E. coli in both early onset sepsis or those like late onset sepsis. Uh, late onset sepsis rate, I copied this from the Canadian Neonatal Network and it report. You can see that among those like, born at less than 26 weeks, uh, less than 27 weeks, at least a quarter to almost like, uh, one third of them, more than one third of them will have at least an episode of the uh, uh, culture proven sepsis during their stay. So this is something that is quite important, but bear in mind in Canadian Neonatal Network, the definitions are a little bit different from those CDC. They need only one blood culture and uh, and also the relevant symptoms and the infants being treated for five days of antibiotics. So these numbers may be higher than the numbers uh, reported by uh, my our colleagues who are following their um, neonatal research network definitions. So going back, we talk about the neonatal sepsis. We talk about some true scenarios that we are seeing every day. Not every day, I exaggerate, but like when we are on call. And um, look at some, about some very kind of like crude microbiology. So then goes back to the fundamental question, what is neonatal sepsis? What are we talking about? So this is a complicated slide I copy from the New England Journal of Medicine. Essentially, the sepsis by itself, that frequently it may not be the bacteria who is causing the trouble, but it is the host response. So essentially the host response to sepsis is characterized by both what we call pro-inflammatory and also the um, anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive response. So the pro-inflammatory response in, um, initiated by some interactions between the pathogens as well as the um, pathogens, the host cells, and Afterwards, there will be uh, some that expressed by the whole cells at the surface, such as the those are what we call the toli receptors or C-type lactin receptors. So the consequence of this exaggerated information is collateral tissue damage, necrosis, cell death, and there will also be mediated a whole bunch of those the uh, series of reactions, uh, like those uh, what we call kind of like leaking type of the in our microcirculation. On the other hand, is um, this this kind of like exaggerated informations by itself, it may also actually is like um, uh, uh, causing troubles that have some impact on both the adrenal cells, neural endocrine regulations, and it affects the production of the cortisol. It may also cause immunosuppression, which enhance susceptibility to further infections. 
So shock. So I try to copy this from some of those standard texts. People are talking about shock all the time, but like the the word of shock may mean different things in different people's mindset. So shock essentially is a state of cell glue and tissue hypoxia due to reduced oxygen delivery, increased oxygen consumption, and also oxygen utilization. So basically, less oxygen delivered, the cells are not able to use the oxygens. And as a result of the hypoxia, the cells will switch to the anaerobic metabolism. There will be accumulation of lactic acid. So that's where we found in terms of we measure the serum exits. When there's increased lactate, we say, oh gosh, like the um, confusion may not be good. This is because the cells turn into anaerobic mechanisms. <coughs> Excuse me. So increased level of lactic acids will cause metabolic acidosis, which will interfere the cell organ functions. And such tissue hypoperfusion may also trigger endothelial dysfunction, stimulation of those inflammatory, anti-inflammatory cases that I mentioned in my previous slide, activation of the process, humoral neural endocrine process, which disrupt the microcirculations, affect the cortisol response, resulting in further tissue injury. In the classical teaching, we always talk about warm shock and cold shock. So warm shock is actually like there's a reduced systemic vascular resistance, increased cardiac output, vasodilatation, feel the baby, the baby looks really well, well perfused, tachycardic. Cold shock, peripheral vessel constrictions to maintain the blood pressure, increased systemic vascular resistance, cold and uh, marbled ends, mortal, uh, delayed refueled, or like urea. So these are the classical descriptions but the life is not that simple. So if you go back to some pathophysiology mechanisms of the possible differential, uh, possible uh, cause of the shock, strictly speaking, you can find basically four categories of shock. One is hypovolemic, one is distributive, one is cardiogenic, one is obstructive, and even more often it is multifactorial. It's a mix of these four categories. So hypovolemic shock in neonates, why do I have to talk about hypovolemic shock in this setting of the neonatal septic shock? The reason is that for those preterm neonates, when they're in the, um, when they're, especially those with early onset sepsis, of sudden the baby may have um, query septic shock. We are already given broad spectrum antibiotics uh, within the first, first uh, hours of life. However, the baby may deteriorate suddenly at 12 to 24 hours of life because of active breathing. And then you put the ultrasound probe on the head and you find that there's a great free grade for IVH. So this, this will sometimes lead to the hypovolemic shock if you only give the vessel pressure, it's not going to work. Don't forget in those extremely preterm infants, especially those 24, 25, 26 weeks or those SJ infants, they may have the frank diuresis, uh, when they're recovering from acute kidney injury, whether it is in utero, postnatal, sometimes you never know. And they have, uh, because of the very poor tubular functions, the babies can pee into the state of even hypotension. First spacing is pretty common. Acute intestinal injury, like a scenario one, the baby may have a frank necrotizing enterocolitis or even sepsis due to whatever reasons, there will be ileus and there will be tons of first spacing in the intestinal tract. As a result, there will be decreased intravascular volume. This is what we call the spacing. So these are the phenomena of the hypovolemic shock. Uh, I try to stay away from the talking about those uh, different intracranial subgaleal hemorrhage, but these are some of the scenarios that we commonly encounter in those uh, preterm infants. Distributive shock. We talk about the reduced systemic vascular resistance and normal vascular tone because of mild distribution of blood flow within the microcirculations, resulting in the hypoperfusions. Common examples that I have illustrated in the scenario one is when the baby has got sepsis, um, there will be tons of the vessel active mediators that may depress the autonomic nervous system, affect the systemic circulations, diffuse vessel dilatations. We've, we feel the baby looks warm, looks nice, but actually the tissue perfusions are compromised. And to further complicate the stuff that not infrequently, these babies may have relative adrenal insufficiency because of uh, prematurity or because of the part of the inflammatory cassette, there will be impaired adrenocortical uh, hormones um, release at the cell 
release as well. So this will also affect the vasomotor tone. So this will cause uh, distributive shock. Cardiogenic shock, we, so myocardial dysfunction is not uncommon. So the common scenario is like, for example, in the, with the sepsis, for those infants with like the frank sepsis, they, those like uh, endotoxins, they may have some negative impact on the myocardial contractility. And sometimes these infants may also be complicated with the chronic fetal hypoxemia in the SGA infants with it, where they may have relatively low reserve. Uh, transitions may be delayed, may or, which may or may not be related to sepsis. Anyway, with all this coming together, the myocardial injury dysfunctions may be related to the sepsis, may be related to the complications such as PPHN. The frank result is myocardial dysfunction. So in th those cases, just use the high dose vasopressor is not going to work. To complicate the stuff, sometimes we worry about the sepsis, but the but Sometimes, especially those left alveolar tract obstructions with the PDA closure, they can be mimickers of the neonatal sepsis. Um, while hyperplastic left heart syndrome should be readily diagnosed, uh, like in the uh, during the antenatal period, sometimes the the coarctation or interrupt aortic arch they may not be readily pick up in all the antenatal ultrasounds. And then with some kind of like some other pathologies. Those are uh, super systemic, uh, what we call RV dependent systemic circulations with the RV failure because of the sepsis, because of the super systemic PPHN, or even sometimes with great vein of Galen malformations. And with the PDA closure, the baby can crash in front of you. And uh, it could be due to underlying sepsis, it could be due to something else, but it could be, all can be great mimickers of the sepsis. So myocardial function, dysfunction leading to cardiogenic shock is something that we need to bear in mind. Obstructive shocks, hopefully it will be readily diagnosed because of the frank pneumothorax, cardiac tampona, um, like the other mediastinomas, they are pretty rare, but pneumothorax, cardiac, cardiac tampona is something that we need to really consider when there is kind of like shock key status because sometimes you fix the tension pneumothorax, the things can change dramatically. Multifactorial shock. So sepsis sometimes can give, as I illustrate in both cases, it can be distributive shock, it can be a cardiogenic shock, and it can also be hypovolemic shock because of the first spacing distributing shock related to sepsis by itself. Cardiogenic shock can be related to sepsis by itself or frank PPHN causing the RV failure and then by ventricular dysfunction. Severe intestinal injuries, for example, relate to the NEC. Of course, there will be hypovolemic shock due to the first spacing, but with the ongoing information process, there will be distributive shock as well. For those infants with the sepsis, it's not uncommon for them to have the frank pulmonary hypertension, which may result in functional pulmonary atresia, right ventricular or biventricular functions, which will result in some kind of like cardiogenic shock. So, I mean, warm shock, cold shock, they are, these are the classical teachings. They're very important for us to recognize. However, life is not that simple. I illustrate about the hypovolemic, cardiogenic, distributive, obstructive shock. And in the real life, it is not infrequent. It's a mix of, of this type of the shock. And then the, to further complicate it, um, this lack of the evidence-based treatment, a lot of common scenarios. For example, like when you talk about definition of septic shock, do the literature use the same definitions? The problem is we don't have a unified definition of septic shock. In a lot of those literature, where they compare different type of treatments, they also use the clinical sepsis included in the septic shock. So what does clinical sepsis mean? It means a lot of things. Studies, they may, they, they may use different types of the outcomes, 7-day mortality, 14-day mortality, neonatal mortality, BPD, blah, blah, blah. So it's very difficult to understand, to compare directly the findings of different uh, studies, and many of them do not have a detailed illustration of individual pathophysiology. So I'm confused you, trying to confuse you by one of the very great publications by in the pediatric research in year 2024. I just uh, found it uh, 
this morning. So this is a great uh, uh, kind of like, I, I really like this uh, this review article, summarize those uh, prospective clinical studies looking at the the, those are the echo findings related to the septic shock. So most of these studies, they include uh, 20, 30, 40, or maybe some 60 infants with some culture positive septic shock or some with some match control with something. And they're, they're kind of like, what they have found is that elevated cardiac output with low systemic vascular resistance consistent with warm shock, food responsive low preload status in the sepsis. Or like infants with the sepsis may be at increased risk of acute pulmonary hypertension. Another six studies here, global cardiac dysfunction reduced in sepsis. They may be uh, LV systolic dysfunctions, maybe a feature of the sepsis. So what I'm trying to say is that I'm here to confuse you uh, because there are lots of studies, but many of these studies, they only include a small number of the patients. And then in the subsequent slide, I also always tell you, I'm going to tell you that some of these kind of like a lot of those studies, they are from retrospective cohort. We don't have a lot of those well uh, designed, high quality randomized controlled trial, maybe because of the difficulties as well. So to complicate the stuff in the hemodyne in preterm infants, it can be even more difficult because of their impaired preload relative to positive pressure in ventilation, the myocardium uh, less capable of mounting up the cardiac output, which I'm going to illustrate in the next slide, and also some denervation, hypersensitivity, and skew response to cat catecholamine agents. The, uh, we know that in those very preterm infants, especially for those SGA infants, not infrequently, they have way more collagens, they have less uh, developed sacrophosphate reticulum. In summary, is that they have less, ca less capacities in mounting up the response in keeping the increased metabolic demand associated with the sepsis. Um, they have a less vascular reserve and also decreased capacities in the autoregulation in the face of the sepsis. They may have some troubles in um, basically in the um, uh, both the uh, decreased alveolar anti-inflammatory activities, impaired alveolarization, increased pre-existing inflammations already. They may have more pulmonary vascular resistance, more PPHN, and um, their renals, their, their kidneys are kind of like less developed. They may be more prone to uh, acute in kidney injury um, as well as the uh, fluid accumulation. On the other extreme is like they may have like less capacity to reabsorb fluid. They may run into the hypovolemic shock easily. So there are many unfavorable factors, hemodynamic considerations among preterm infants express, which may contribute to the unique hemodynamic phenotype. Uh, in case of the sepsis, making the treatments management even more difficult and challenging compared with those born at term. I'm sure you'll get confused and same as I. What should I do? So we are going to go through some of the clinical features, how the TN echo can help you. We're going to talk about the classical phenotypes and choice of medication based on the, on the uh, best practices and existing literatures. Clinical manifestations, Frequently, these infants may ex exhibit tachycardia um, because the heart rate is the main me compensatory mechanism to maintain increased uh, cardiac output. As I, stroke as I said before, the capacity to increase stroke volume is um, limited in infants, especially in those preterm infants. Low, cardi uh, low heart rate is a late sign. Hypotension is a late finding. In some of those classical textbooks, they say, in infants, especially those are preemies, they may have to lose 30-40% of its blood volume to show some hypotension. I don't know how these uh, numbers comes from, but um, I think like pretty consistently from our observation, from the classical teaching, hypotension is late calf like finding. And uh, body temperature, don't expect the baby will have a high swinging fever because of their autonomic uh, nervous system dysfunction. Sometimes they may uh, show hypothermia or even more commonly um, we are being called for the uh, what they call uh, unstable temperature. Um, challenging, they will present with cold extremities, delayed capillary refuse, but these are very difficult to uh, identify, uh, very difficult to, um, to, to differentiate from some of the other causes, for example, even in the acrosinosis in the normal neonates or anemia, 
um, in the very early life and uh, capital refill is a very poor predictive value and not a reliable physical findings when they compare with other um, when they look at those infants who are having shock as well. So in summary, it's like clinical findings are important. You have to always have to go to examine your baby. However, they don't have an excellent predictability as what we like to have. And this is one of the classical studies looking at the evaluation between the serum lactate as well as the SVC flow. Uh, where they try to do some kind of like correlation, you can see the dots are here are all over the place. Lactate is a kind of like, it's a marker of the anaerobic respirations of the cell and the microcirculation SVC flow. It's very difficult to correlate one with another. I'm sure you are getting more confused. So as we are talking about hemodynamics, we have to talk about the echo as well as some physiology. So when you first call to the backside, the first thing, of course, you have to see the baby, examine the baby, but have a look of what's going on with the blood pressure numbers. Don't give the kind of knee-jerk response. If someone telling you about mean, mean blood pressure is low, then give some uh, give some bolus volume. If blood volume doesn't work, mean blood pressure is low below the um, mean gestational age, start some dopamine. I think that is the not the very good way of the response and we need to think about what are the underlying costs we know that cardiac output is kind of like heart, uh, heart rate times stroke volume systemic vascular resistant uh, resistant is kind of manifestation of the neuro endocrine and paracrine regulatory mechanism so blood pressure is a is kind of like is a representation of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance and systolic blood pressure particularly is a good marker for the uh, for the cardiac output, while diastolic blood pressure is a good marker for the systemic vascular resistance, I I like this um this um uh, table from uh, late Reagan published in the seminars in perinatology. Always use this to teach the trainees when there is a low systolic uh, blood pressure, it means low cardiac output. We need to think about the causes of reduced preload, whether it could be the artery dysfunction, hypovolemia. Reduce contractility because of the because of the uh, whether it could be related to some asphyxia components, whether it could be related to as kind of like the uh, primary um, uh, cardiac dysfunction secondary to sepsis. It could sometimes be because of the frank increase in afterload because of the cold shock as well. Think about what are the potential pathophysiology in your baby's diastolic blood pressure when diastolic blood pressure is low. In tiny babies, worry about enlarged vascular back is a big PDA, worry about the sepsis, system inflammatory response, as what we mentioned about the vasodilatation. And of course, hypovolemia is can be secondary to capillary leak or the first space, uh, significant first space loss. And um, don't forget that for those infants, we are using the heavy uh, sedation, especially those uh, when the baby is on the high dose of uh, midazolam infusion, high dose of like, uh, the opioid infusions, and then together with the relative adrenal insufficiency, you will see the vessel dilatation and also low vascular resistance. Think about what is the systolic component of the baby and what are the diastolic component of hypotension. Remember that the mean blood pressure is something artificial. It doesn't tell you anything about the pathophysiology. Look at the systolic and diastolic components. Uh, so, of course, the... Um, because we are talking about TNE, so TNE is extremely important. Remember that like TNE will be able to give you some important um, uh, uh, information about what exactly the phenotype, clinical phenotype is. For example, it can tell you the left heart functions um, in terms of systolic and diastolic function. You can measure the uh, ejection fraction through the ammo, uh, Simpson's plan to have a good estimate of the systolic function. Um, through the, the measurement of IVRT and also the uh, the EA ratio over the mitral valve and also tissue Doppler imaging, you have a good understanding of the diastolic function as well. If you're familiar with the um, LV strain, um, those like uh, uh, um, the um, uh, <coughs> the other techniques, uh, you can also measure the LV strain as well. Those are uh, 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 tracking. And you can also measure the systemic blood flow through the left ventricular output, LVO. Right heart function is also very important. Nowadays, we have way more technologies than before. Uh, 
in terms of like traditional technologies to uh, traditional markers, including the right ventricular output, TAPC, our refractional area shortenings to look at the systolic function, TDI of the IVS and RV free wall, as well as the speckle tracking measure in the RV string. These are all parameters allow us to quantify the systolic and the diastolic function. PDA and as well as the atrial shunting are also very important to tell us what exactly is going on in terms of the uh, the relatively systolic, uh, relatively systemic to uh, the, the 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 pulmonary pressures assessment of P pressures. We can also use the tricuspid regurgitation jet if the RV function is reasonable. Septal curvature can also tell us, like the second scenario with a lot of the paradoxical septal movement. You know that the pulmonary pressure is a uh, super systemic. You can measure the LV eccentric city index from the professional short axis view. You can look at the um, uh, the uh, P Doppler waveform to see if there's any mid systolic launching. RVET to uh, time to peak velocity ratio is also very helpful. If it is more than four, it likely signifies significant pulmonary pressure. And organ perfusion is important equally. Like see, look at the Doppler patterns of the ciliary artery, superior mesenteric artery, middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery. So these are the kind of like the fun, the kind of like basic stuff that will be helpful for us to establish whether this is kind of like good heart functions, but high cardiac output, but um, lower pressure, whether it is slightly because of the low uh, uh, systemic vascular resistance or the myocardial function is really bad. We need to give some medication to support uh, the inotrope to support the ventricular dysfunction. Or it may also give us some hints where how bad is the pulmonary pressure, how are we going to support the right ventricle, or we need to start some pulmonary vessel dilators, which will be a important aspect in the treatment for the uh, neonatal septic shock. I'll just go through a few slides of the basic uh, stuff that probably you are already pretty familiar with, and then we'll uh, go back to our scenarios. Um, for those with the uh, pretty poor uh, myocardial dysfunction, sometimes we'll use the dobutamine, which acts basically on the beta receptors. It's a very good medication. It will increase the cardiac output, increase the, uh, uh, maybe increase the stroke volume is those dependent faction. Uh, I say maybe because of the preterm infants, but it will usually increase at least the heart rate um, to and increase the cardiac output. It has a minimal impact on, in general, on the uh, pulmonary pressure and also the afterload. Mirinol is a great drug. It has a selective phosphodiesterase free inhibitors, increased myocardial contractility. It will also selectively decrease the pulmonary vascular back and it may have some a beneficial impact on diastolic dysfunction. However, it can dramatically reduce the after systemic uh, afterload. So um, be very cautious if the brain pain has a profound um, low systemic blood pressure. Mirinol may not be a good drug because it can lead to a profound vasodilatation in systemic circulation. Um, when there's a concern about the, um, when the cardiac output is robust, but it is kind of like warm shot starters, you may have to consider some medications to improve the vessel as acting as a vessel presser, which includes the, include the dopamine. People have been using a lot of dopamine. Um, it will increase the um, it will increase the blood pressure readily, but its impact on the on the uh, on the ventricular output sometimes is kind of like debatable. Uh, it had the 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 response to in the uh, neonate is variable. It may also people the traditional the traditional teaching is that it may reduce the it may cause the renal vessel dilatation uh, in the low dose, but this has never been proven in the uh, neonates. Um, be cautious that, like in those pop, uh, in those uh, publication, uh, those uh, uh, populations, um, especially those preterm, it may increase pulmonary vascular resistance. Vessel pressing mediates through the vivum receptors in vascular smooth muscles, and it is a potent co co uh, constrict vessel constrictor that's been used in the um, catecholamine resistant hypotension. Um, it is very good in those uh, reduction. Uh, especially for those with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy type of the picture. In those infants with the frank sepsis born to the uh, infants of diabetic uh, mother, sometimes vessel pressing is very, very good drug. However, it needs to um, 
um, yeah, the nurses may complain because the vasopressin need to run independently. It doesn't mix well with other uh, medications. It cannot run with the TPN. So it may cause, if you have a limited vascular access, this may cause uh, troubles. Now, epinephrine is a potent non selective alpha agonist. It is very good uh, medications has been used uh, uh, to improve the SVR to PVR ratio. It can improve the, uh, especially the vasomotor tone well. It may also uh, 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 be really helpful in those that with the PPHN. But the advantage is like norepinephrine can run with epinephrine, dopamine, and also the TPNs so that it will, uh, it will bring less pressure on the need for the number of the vascular lumens. Um, one of those uh, small studies uh, published in uh, 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 published a couple of years ago, uh, not a small study, is very important. Yet a pilot study published and from the Texas in uh, general pediatric year two thousand fifteen, and then people looking at the vasopressin versus dopamine for treatment of the hypotension. In this pilot study, they look at the twenty extremely low birth weights, less than thirty weeks and less than twenty four hours. What they found is that the vasopressin group received fewer doses of surfactant had lower PCO, PACO2 values and were less uh, tachycardic. So this basically kind of like uh, bring us, give us some good ideas about like vasopressins can be a reasonable option in those like infants with the uh, significant hypotension. And people have to try to look at some dopamine versus no epinephrine for sepsis related hypotension. And the studies published from the um, the Mount Sinai group in the Toronto, they look at those 35 weeks with cool received dopamine versus uh, dopamine or not epinephrine. They include those infants with the culture proven sepsis as well as those clinical sepsis. They include 156 infants with um, uh, around two thirds receiving dopamine and one, uh, one third receiving the no epinephrine. In those propensity score, what they have found, uh, matched studies, they've, what they have found Sorry, what they have found is that, like for those who are uh, basically receiving uh, no epinephrine, they may have some uh, advantage is, uh, with the in terms of their pre discharge mortality, pre discharge mortality, or, or significant new, neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental impairment as well. So, this uh, with this kind of like study, and then right now we are doing kind of like the uh, clinical. Uh, comparative effective research across the country, looking at the the um the outcome associated with dopamine versus no epinephrine in the sepsis related hypotension, and um don't forget there are some other medications. They both have some inotropic vasopressor activities. Epinephrine low dose they may increase the myocardial contractility. High dose it will frankly increase the systemic vascular resistance. It may also increase the pulmonary vascular resistance as well. So it may not be the ideal option in case of frank PPHN, and don't forget that it may, um, the epinephrine is not uncommon to cause increased lactate as well as the serum glucose, especially in those preterm infants. Steroids, we frequently use the steroid to enhance vascular response, symptoms to catecholamines. It may also be useful when there is uh, concerns about relative adrenal insufficiency as well. Um, don't forget for those infants who are having RE dependent systemic circulations, PG will be helpful as kind of like pop-up valve to maintain the circulation. As I illustrate in the scenario two, for those infants with closed ductus, whether it is a structural or temporary or functional, um, when it closed, it can cause like frank um, deterioration in the um, in the kind of like systemic circulation. So maintaining the um, the, the, the ductal opening by 0.01 to 0.02 micrograms per kilo will be really helpful, at least temporary to maintain the systemic circulation. So going back to scenario one and two, so what are we going to do? In the infants with the frank NEC, with distributive shock, with hypovolemic shock, I think giving the fruit response is very reasonable. Uh, low diastolic blood pressure. So after the TN echo, what are you going to do? The t some some of the colleagues may choose to give the dopamine, which is not unreasonable to increase the systemic vascular resistance, especially PPHN is not a big issue. If you like to use the norepinephrine, um, it's also a reasonable choice. Would you use norepinephrine 
or would you use the vessel present? I think you can tell me or you can uh, share with that in the chat box or to have uh, further discussions. Scenario two is more complicated. The infants have the uh, biventricular failure, frank, di uh, frank PPHN. In those cases, what are we going to do? If someone feels that, oh, the baby has the hypolysic respiratory failure, uh, they would like to use the turn on the nitric oxide, the baby will crash further because there will be further drop in the uh, uh further drop in the um the cardiac output. So in those cases, we need to give some medications to support the ventricles. Um probably um uh what will be a reasonable choice will be some dobutamine, like five to ten mice to I remember I start the dobutamine to support the RV. And then because of the frank um, uh, vascular resist tone, tone as well. And then like um, after starting the dobutamine, um, it's also reasonable to, uh, to act on some vasopressors such as the norepinephrine or vasopressins as well to enhance the SBR to, to PVR ratio. Acting on the nitric oxide to reduce the RV afterload is also very reasonable after we start the the uh, medications and uh, nitric oxide is, has also been started. The baby actually turned around the corner after several days. So I think it's very important when we consider those uh, challenging cases in neonatal sepsis, we have to ask several questions. What is the hemodynamic phenotype? Is the baby intravascular volume depleted? Short answer, yes. We may have to give the fluid, especially like in the scenario of Frank NEC, Frank IVH. How is the ventricular function? Is it the RV failure? Is it biventricular function? What? How are we going to choose the biventriculars, uh, the inotropic support? Do we need some pulmonary vessel dilator? If it is a frank sepsis, if it's RV failure, or like, um, or the RV has not failed yet, but the, there's a super systemic pulmonary pressure, do we need to use some systemic? Uh, do we need to use some pulmonary vessel dilators such as the nitric oxide? Um, do we need to start some vessel presses to help the vessel motor tone? Do we need to act on hydrocortisone? So we have to go through this kind of like mental exercise before we, uh, we, we, we decide what we are going to treat. And of course, right, the general considerations, you may have to win the ventilations, avoid over uh, ventilation to improve the preload. You have to try to improve the ventilations before turning on the nitric oxide to, to, kind, of like opt, uh, to kind of like optimize the impact of the nitric on the VQ mismatch, you have to choose appropriate antibiotics. So take home message. Sorry, I'm a bit uh, over time, but like neonatal septic shock is a serious illness. Currently, there's lack of high quality evidence to guide the treatments. A lot of those studies are extrapolate from pediatric or even adult scenarios. Clinical assessment is always important, but limited kind of like um, informations. TN Echo can help you to manage because you will be able to uh, have a better idea of like what is the phenotype that you are the treating and whether the uh, to follow the response to treatment. Don't forget the phenotype can also change with time. So I would encourage you to, to adopt an individualized approach rather than a cookbook approach because 10, 20 mils of the uh, kilo, kilo of the bolus followed by dopamine, dobutamine, that's not going to work in every single patient. You need to have a uh, to understand the, the individual phenotype and provide some individualized treatment. So I think that is it for my presentation today. Um, so questions are welcome. Great, thank you so much.